Hi, I'm Ryan Szymanski, curator for Battleship New Jersey Museum and Memorial. Today, in our continuing series on World War II naval battles in the Pacific, uh, we're going to talk about the Battle of Cape Esperance. This is one of the battles fought uh, over control of the Solomon Islands. This one was fought in October of 1942, a couple months after the Allies invaded. Previously, the Japanese had decisively defeated an American cruiser squadron at night at Savo Island, and American and Japanese carrier forces had fought each other to a draw. At this point in the campaign, Japan rolls the waters around Guadalcanal at night and uses her fast destroyers to transport troops and supplies onto the island. These destroyers are known as the Tokyo Express by the Allies. Meanwhile, during the day, Allied aircraft from Henderson Field, the airfield on Guadalcanal that the Marines captured early in the campaign, uh, roll the seas and prevent Japanese resupply while allowing the Allies to bring in their own cargo ships and offload heavy materials. The Battle of Cape Esperance was an American attempt to use its radar-guided cruisers to cut off the Tokyo Express. This is a force of destroyers that's heavily laden with troops and supplies, so if the American cruisers can catch them at night as they try to offload supplies on the northernmost point of Guadalcanal, Cape Esperance, uh, then they can strike a major blow to the Japanese, take over control of the night, and start turning the balance for the land war uh, and allow the Allies to have more supplies than the Japanese. The Japanese actually had two forces sailing into Iron Bottom Sound that night. The first force was the Tokyo Express destroyers to the north. Uh, and they would actually take no major part in the surface battle. The second force was a force of cruisers and destroyers which was going to bombard Henderson Field. If they could knock it out of action, then the American advantage of ruling the daytime would be negated. On the Allied side, American Admiral Norman Scott had a force of two heavy cruisers, two light cruisers, and five destroyers. He was sailing north to try and find the Tokyo Express ships. His ships had uh, express orders for a night fight, and some of his ships had the very modern SG, or Sugar George, surface search radar sets. They could theoretically spot enemy ships at 15 to 20 miles at night, uh, and they had started to learn how to use the technology so they weren't running into the same issues they had at Savo Island, where the clutter of nearby land masses obscured ships. Cape Esperance was an incredibly confusing melee combat. Around 11 o'clock that night, the moon set, so it was completely dark. You couldn't see the horizon. As a consequence, neither side knew if they were shooting at their own ships or Japanese ships. Uh, the Japanese had extremely superior night training uh, and optics. However, without any light at all and not expecting to encounter an American force, they didn't have their float planes up to drop flares like they had at Savo Island. Uh, the, the Japanese were completely running blind. And as they started to take shots, assume that it was their own ships firing at them, since they had a second force operating in the area. Uh, meanwhile, Admiral Scott's force had gotten a little bit separated. They made a turn in complete darkness, and some of the ships had fallen out of the column. So at that point, Scott didn't know which ships, the little dots on his radar screens, were his, and which were the Japanese. At this point in the war, IFF, or Identification Friend or Foe, uh, an electronic signal that ships could transmit and then have decoded to say whether they're good or not, uh, 
hasn't really been developed. So Scott's ships sail in. Uh, the Japanese ships are sailing to the south, Scott to the north. Um, and they end up getting to within two and a half miles of each other. Knife fighting range. Uh, the lookouts on the various ships could see each other. However, the two admirals, Goto for the Japanese and Scott for the Americans, still weren't sure that they were looking at enemy ships, uh, and they didn't have all of the information. We're sitting here in Battleship New Jersey's Combat Engagement Center, a space where all of our electronic equipment is located uh, so that as we're getting information from surface search, air search, height finding, identification friend or foe, uh, electronic uh, decryption, that sort of stuff. As that information is being get gotten by the ship, it can be plotted so that it's all being condensed into one place uh, and we can coordinate with other ships so that our captain now has a complete picture of the battlefield. Scott didn't have that available to him. His various radar consoles, because of limitations at the time, were stuck in weird places. They, they had been fitted aftermarket to his ships. They were not all condensed, and there wasn't really a, a great tactic yet to use them. So the information wasn't being reported to him. Some of the information he got told him the position of Japanese ships. He assumed it was missing ships from his own column. Uh, so even though they had spotted Japanese ships at 15 miles away, uh, they were within two and a half miles before they'd seen the Japanese ships. Uh, and quite frankly, Scott got lucky. He had inadvertently maneuvered his ships to be crossing the T of the Japanese ships at point-blank range. And at that point, armor plating means nothing. His, his light cruiser's six-inch guns, his destroyer's five-inch guns, could punch through any armor that the Japanese had. By the same token, their shells could, could pass through his, but because he had crossed the enemy's T, all of his ships could fire their full broadsides. The Japanese ships coming straight at him, only the forwardmost ships could fire, and they could only fire their forwardmost guns. They couldn't use their super effective long lance torpedoes, which had to be fired more broadside, um, and many of the ships were obscured by their own ships, and frankly, didn't know friend from foe. Scott's light cruisers, which had much more effective uh, radars than his own larger heavy cruisers, spotted the Japanese and identified them first and requested permission to fire. The, the message sent was interrogative Roger, which was just a pre- decided upon message, uh, request, hey, can, can I take action independently? Uh, Scott's flagship sent back, Roger, we have received your message and we'll get back to you with an answer. Well, Roger also means yes over the radio sometimes. So some of Scott's ships started firing point blank into these Japanese ships uh, and they hit Godo's flagship at the head of the column first, repeatedly. She probably took about 40 rounds, uh, and Godo ended up being killed in the action, uh, and, and his flagship, Aobo, was disabled and dropped out of line. Uh, and then the ship behind him, the heavy cruiser Furutaka, then got the full attention of the American force. Uh, and th this really is, if two people get into a bathtub, you turn out the lights and then they draw knives on each other and start fighting. You know, sometimes they cut themselves, sometimes they cut the enemy, uh, and nobody really knows who won. Th that's what this battle was. Some of the American ships were damaged, some probably by friendly fire. Some of the Japanese ships were damaged. A couple of ships sunk. Um, both sides retreated at the end. Um, and at the end of the day, the Americans were able to claim a tactical victory. They had avenged Savo Island and won a night battle through sheer blind dumb luck. Uh, 
But the strategic situation on Guadalcanal had not changed at all. The Japanese Tokyo Express destroyers were able to unload their supplies unmolested and retreat. The um, fighting continued as it had. The Japanese still ruled the night and the Americans still ruled the day. So, here we are, three major naval battles into uh, the Guadalcanal campaign. And we're not at the end yet. Tune in next week to see what happens. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, drop them in the comment section down below and we'll get back to you. Uh, if you would like to support our YouTube channel or the museum, check out the description below for ways you can donate and help us out. Uh, and remember to like, share, and subscribe so you're notified when we get new content.